Yeah, it is. It's Tuesday. It's all right, baby. Ayla Brooke and the Soundman. That's Desolation Sounds. You know, that would be a great holiday gift. Wouldn't that be a great Christmas gift? Uh, top up whatever Santa's going to bring and get Desolation Sounds, the actual. Maybe, maybe pressed on wax. Do you know, is it pressed, Sam? Did they did they do vinyl for... Uh, I believe their, they do have a vinyl press. Fallen Tree it. Records yeah. release. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and certainly on compact disc. I know because I have one. Uh, we're so grateful to be able to play that music every day as we welcome you to Real Talk. This episode is presented by our good friends at Bitcoin Well. Not pressed on wax, because it's all... I'm going to have to try too hard to bring this around. This is... uh, They're talking about financial sovereignty. It's one of the interesting angles, one of the interesting umbrellas under which you can try to wrap your mind around cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. They started me at the very beginning. I remember the first time I went in there, I talked to this guy, Benny. I recommend you ask for Benny at Bitcoin Well. If you go there in person or give him a call, I was like, let's just start from the very beginning so you can help me understand what this is all about. Looks at me, big smile, big beard. He says, no dumb questions, Jespo. You can find him under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Big show coming up in about 40 minutes. We're going to talk to uh, Ray Cash Walters, criminal defense lawyer, Joshua Seeley Harrington, a lawyer and a, a law prof, and then Sharif Haji, who's going to be joining us from the Africa Center, executive director there, uh, has worked with several government ministries as well, a, a roundtable on this Tuesday morning around uh, racism in the United States and Canada. We took a look at several verdicts that were being delivered or trials that were underway or in some tragic obviously in maddening circumstances crimes against people based on race one of them set to be tried federally in the united states as a hate crime uh and 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 we started to wonder started to think you know as canadians and it seems like we've been having these conversations over the past couple of days certainly yesterday on two fronts hey hoyles we were talking about whether or not we're that different from our american counterparts when it when it comes to our neighbors i should call them when it when it comes to the so-called gun culture Uh, when it comes to abortion yesterday, that conversation we had yesterday really resonated with real talkers. Our email inbox really interesting yesterday. And I loved that our inbox represented the audience, which is a good cross section. People coming from different perspectives, obviously when it comes to conversations around abortion, different angles, different things that matter to people with regards to the language that we use in those conversations or the questions that we ask or the perspectives that the guests have. And I thought that that was really great. When we take a look at the United States, though, we can't absolve ourselves of racism, systemic racism, can we? I mean, we took a look through the Black Lives Matter demonstrations and a lot of Canadians were going, geez, look at down in the United States. And then, of course, what happens? A national conversation about our own atrocities, about our own history with regards to residential schools. And not that Black Lives Matter didn't resonate in Canada either or a hundred other things. And so I think this conversation is going to be a really good one. That's coming up in about 35 minutes. We're going to talk to a fella coming up in about 25 minutes who's, who's grandma in her 90s. I mean, he says she's an Italian Wolverine. We're, we'll get a status update on her. Tough lady. But she wound up laying on the floor for an hour after falling over the weekend, it's prompting a bigger and more public conversation about EMS dispatch, ambulance dispatch, and maybe what what could potentially be at this point assessed as a failed experiment to centralize dispatch. A lot of times stories like this, they just need a face on them. The stories just need a face. When you find out that there's a 95-year-old Don't Italians, I think they call their grandmothers Nana. Is that right? So his Nana, when a 95-year-old Nana is laying on the floor for an hour, potentially with a broken leg, broken hip, it's going to get people's attention. It's going to get people pissed off. I would say Nona. Nona. Okay, well, I can work on my pronunciation. Maybe we can ask him. I've been working on his name. So Marcello Dicentio will join us. What a beautiful name that is. I'll, I'll play it cool, though, when he joins us. And, of course, we're keeping an eye on other stories, including uh, the Americans, a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympic Games. What is that? First of all, what does it mean? Should Canada follow suit? That's coming up in just a second with Dr. Ashley Isari. This isn't maybe a boycott, or, or maybe it is uh, Canadian f- superstar entertainment superstar mega celebrity drake has withdrawn his grammy nominations 
which is also kind of an interesting story. We're following it tepidly right now because nobody, I mean, people have their speculation, Mm. but nobody really knows why. No, he's not actually revealed why he's withdrawn it. Um, I mean, I thought, you know, he's he is embroiled in all that, uh, like the death that happened in uh, Astro World. Right. That That big concert. Um, I mean, he hasn't been at Raptors games and usually he's right on the sideline, like given major face so uh i yeah he's kind of a wall right now he's been critical about the grammys in past mm. he's talked about how he thinks that there should be kind of a, a, a revamp or an entirely new set of awards that he's indicated this is my paraphrase of what he said but that would more or better stand the test of time um he was pissed off a couple of years ago i think it was when another canadian megastar the weekend was snubbed by the grammys meantime had the the biggest album in the world and i know that that was something that drake took issue with so that's something we're keeping an eye on interesting stuff so these stories to come including whether or not canada should consider boycotting the beijing olympics that's coming up uh with uh, uh we're looking forward to this dr ashley asari is a political scientist going to join me in just a moment uh, first, we know that this is the time of year where you are looking to find something absolutely perfect uh, to gift to that person that's maybe a little bit more difficult to buy with, either they have everything or they don't seem to like anything or whatever it is. Sometimes the consumable gifts can be best. Let's find out what they're saying about the Real Talk Cask number one bourbon from Woody Creek Distillers. Check this out a stunning photo. Posted on Instagram from Know Your Whiskey. We encourage you to give them a follow at Know Your Whiskey. It says, Whiskey folks in the great white north were blessed with an early Christmas gift this year. A single cask pick from Ryan Jesperson made with 100% Olathe sweet corn. This whiskey has a very unique flavor that immediately drew me in. And when I say it's extremely earthy, I mean it tastes just like soil, straight up sweet corn, corn husks. And soil, absolutely delicious. That from Know Your Whiskey. Corn and soil, soil and corn. I guess I don't know whiskey. Yeah. Six years aged right? in the virgin oak, the charred, heavily charred oak barrels. Unbelievable stuff. You can find it right now for a limited time. 210 bottles total, and they're going to go quick. Uh, in Edmonton at Sherbrooke Liquor and Whiskey Drop. In Calgary at Vine Arts. And you can check out my Twitter at Ryan Jesperson. I just tweeted out a link. For the bigger list, uh, where you can find other spirits by the Woody Creek Distillers team uh, as part of their Canadian launch. That was just yesterday. Really exciting time for them. I also want to tell you about Poppy Barley and why we're so proud to partner with this brand. Two sisters own this brand, Kendall and Justine, out of Alberta, out of Edmonton, in fact, and they're doing amazing work. This is what it looks like when you go to poppybarley.com and order. This is what this is what's going to wind up. Check this out just a few days later. Get your orders in today, everybody. They can still make it happen. They're going to arrive. Live outside the box. You get into it, and, and what do you find? Right away, they're supporting local. That's right. This is an independently owned, locally run family business doing amazing luxury brands. But there they are supporting other local companies. You can learn more at poppybarley.com. And then you get into the absolutely most beautiful, comfortable, incredible, stunning, show-stopping boots and shoes you're ever going to wear. I guarantee I'm loving my Nelson Chelsea boots and my Yukon lace-up boots. And of course, you can... Ask him to load you up with all the cleaning and protective treatments you need as well. Poppy Barley right now stands for a new kind of luxury. That's fair prices on products you wear on repeat. These are amazing investments. You can learn more about their men's and women's lineup. The men's just revamped. Looks incredible at poppybarley.com. Well, the United States uh, will at least diplomatically boycott the Beijing Olympic Games. This from American President Joe Biden uh, just yesterday. That means that the U.S. won't send any officials, any representatives to the 2022 Winter Olympics, which, by the way, are set to kick off on February 4th. New Zealand says that it won't send diplomats either, uh, but athletes are still set to go wearing the stars and stripes. Under the flag of New Zealand, will they be there under the maple leaf and other international entries? Is it a smart move? Are athletes put into dangerous circumstances if this is the case? Uh, Dr. Ashley Asari is an associate professor in political science at the University of Alberta, specializing in media and politics, specifically in China and Taiwan, along with environmentalism, peace and security in East Asia and leadership politics it's a pleasure to welcome dr sorry to the show thanks for making time for us welcome to real talk 
Oh, it's a great pleasure, Ryan. Thanks were, for having me. Yeah, were you? So this is all. I mean, obviously, people are are paying attention to the the story of of Chinese tennis star uh, Peng Shui, and uh, others have have cited other reasons, other human rights abuses alleged or proven when it comes to potential boycotts of these Beijing games. Obviously, a huge announcement when the American president chimes in. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> it was expected. You know, it was a couple days in 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 rolling out uh, the decision to. Uh, announced the the diplomatic boycott, uh, and you know, in my view, uh, it's it's of symbolic importance. And you know, really, the big question, and you've kind of raised it already, is how much uptake is this going to lead to? Uh, you know, New Zealand has said, you know, it's not going to send uh, diplomats, but it's sort of citing COVID as a reason for that. Uh, you know, what's Canada going to do? What are what are other countries around the world who are like the United States, really uh, concerned with human rights? Uh, gonna do you know and does it does it really matter uh, to make a symbolic statement like this and not send um, diplomats uh, uh, or other people of significance as the United States and other countries have done in the past yeah so why first of all why does it matter why does the boycott matter does it does it embarrass the host nation does it take away from the credibility of the Olympic Games themselves well I think uh, for a country like China they're hosting the games because they want to announced to the world that they're, you know, a, a superpower, they've got the means and the organizational capacity to, to pull off something. You know, North China isn't known for great quality snow and ski resorts. Uh, it's, it's a way of, you know, China saying uh, to the world, uh, hey, we're a superpower, you know, we've arisen. Uh, and they're hoping to get some, some payout uh, from from something like this, you know, Olympic Games aren't usually these, these years, uh, money making endeavors uh, especially during COVID because you can't, you know, you can't have so many spectators. Uh, and, you know, in this, in this instance, it's, it's about the symbolic importance of, you know, of a country being a leader uh, and, and showing what it can do. Um, the, so it's a, it's a, a national prestige endeavor uh, more than anything else. And Chinese statements in response to the U.S. announcement have been pretty critical uh, you know, saying that it's a you know insult to 1.4 billion Chinese people, and you know, urging the United States to reflect and and change its ways, uh, and also saying that there would be uh, serious consequences uh, if the U.S. persists, you know, in going forward with this diplomatic boycott. What could those so, be? I mean, what could that look like? Could, serious consequences. I, I mean, I guess China can turn up the temperature on a whole bunch of fronts if it so chooses. This is true, and. The U.S. announcement is taking place in a broader context in which China is upset uh, about, uh, you know, U.S. expressions of concern about the rollback of democracy in Hong Kong. Uh, it released a, a statement about U.S. democracy, of all things, uh, uh, about a day ago, and it was very critical of, of the United States uh, democratic system. And you know, it's pretty easy to criticize the U.S., pretty easy to criticize any country in terms of how uh, the government functions. Um, and, and the Biden administration, I think, was responding uh, to that uh, with this announcement. Uh, obviously, they're concerned about human rights. Uh, Taiwan is a big issue of, of, of serious military concern to the United States right now. In the last two months, China has flown more sorties into Taiwan's airspace than ever before. Uh, October, the biggest month ever, I think it was close to a couple hundred uh, uh, aircraft sorties went through uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, air defense identification zone. Last month, the month of Glasgow, you know, when China and the U.S. were trying to come together and, 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 and get an agreement on, on doing something about climate change, was a month in which Taiwan had the second most Chinese sorties in its airspace. And, and the U.S. has a longstanding if unofficial relationship with Taiwan in which it sees threats to its security is a matter of grave concern and the U.S. is obliged by law, U.S. law, to, you know, see threats to Taiwan's security as, as, as problematic and to help Taiwan defend itself. And that's what the United States government has been doing. So this is sort of the larger issue uh, that's taking uh, taking place in the backstory, you know, kind of in the background of all of this. There are lots of, lots of tensions between the two sides. The Chinese statement did say uh, that you know, the Biden announcement of the diplomatic boycott uh, was um, was was manipulating politics and manipulating sport for political purposes. And um, it was uh, risking derailing cooperation in other important areas. And I was thinking immediately climate change, where mm -hmm. the two countries have 
despite the odds, been trying to work together uh, and trade, uh, where the two countries have, you know, had this trade war that dates back to the Trump years uh, that has really carried forward uh, in the Biden administration. Well, and that's why I mean, to state the obvious, that's why I think that this would be uh, a situation of concern to athletes, even American athletes, a diplomatic boycott, you know, as of right now. I mean, we're talking on on December 7th. The games aren't for another couple of months. But as of right now, American athletes are free to go compete. Uh, the Canadians, I, I don't think will soon forget the the plight of the two Michaels, Kovrig and Spavor, who were taken into custody uh, over the entire Huawei debacle. Right. With with the Huawei executive. I mean. I mean, can you trust this administration in China right now to leave the athletes alone? Or can this get to a situation where potentially the athletes are putting themselves uh, in harm's way simply by attending? Well, I don't have the sense from, uh, you know, the buzz around China, Chinese politics scholarship that athletes themselves are at risk. And the U.S. statement um, by the Biden administration said that it was you know, 100% supportive of U.S. athletes uh, going. It just wasn't going to add to the pomp and circumstance of, of the uh, the Olympics. I uh, didn't want to treat the Olympic Games as business as usual. I guess um, was a remark that came um, from the White House spokes, uh, spokeswoman. Um, so, so do athletes? Are athletes likely to be safe? I, I mean, my view uh, <laughs> as someone who isn't putting his life on the line or liberty on the line, sure, uh, is is the answer is yes, but you know, what if athletes make statements uh, supportive of human rights uh, or, you know, supportive of Peng Shui, um, this woman who has you know, criticized the top Chinese leader, former vice premier, rape uh, and disappeared largely uh, from appearance. You know, I mean, are athletes going to face that kind of treatment? Uh, I think the expectation is, is no. Um uh, and, and it's in part because Beijing has so much on the line here. Uh, it wants a successful games. Uh, and indeed, um, you know, the remarks by uh, the, the Chinese foreign ministry uh, over the last couple of days have said, you know, regardless of what the U.S. does, it's not going to affect the success of the games. So they're definitely gambling on that. Hmm. We've got some interesting comments here on, on our live chat. Uh, Sharon just says, I'm so sick of this kind of flexing. Uh, you know, Scott says if the U.S. was actually serious about hurting China, they'd outlaw manufacturing things in China. But rich people like cheap labor. Craig says, I know we'd be excited. Here's a hockey comment. Uh, he says we'd be excited to see McDavid and Crosby and McKinnon on the same team. Don't forget Cole Mc Kale McCarr uh, says, but to go kick ass in Beijing. But perhaps we shouldn't go. Uh, it's hard as a hockey fan, but I think it's necessary. Interesting. I've heard some people talk about holding the hockey tournament in, in North American soil. I don't think you can do that. Kind of flies in the face of the spirit of the games. You think that Canada's pulled into this uh, de facto just because of the Americans' position? I mean, if the Americans boycott, does Canada boycott too? Not necessarily. And and one thing to remember, um, this is sort of responding to some of the comments you're getting, is that the U.S. is not boycotting in the sense it's not, this isn't 1980. It's not sending, it's sending athletes. 1980 was about not sending athletes because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. That's not happening this time. You know, U.S. athletes are going. The U.S. government is supportive of their participation in the games. So for me, the question for Canada is, are you considering some sort of a, a downplaying of the significance of these games in light of ongoing concerns over human rights in China? And of course, concerns about how the two Michaels uh, were treated. Um, so, you know, there's, there's sort of a diplomatic decision uh, to make here. If Canada were to say, we're not going to send athletes, that would be a real statement. And in a sense, Canada would be stepping out ahead of the United States uh, uh, and, and the U S position right now. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that, that would be a, a real powerful statement. And I recognize there are a lot of people in this country that that support that position but i haven't i haven't heard that other countries are taking that position yet and and canada of course has so much at stake too because the winter olympics is really when canadian athletes shine i was just going to say you got to think of the athletes too like do the athletes want the boycott yeah. i doubt it no no so uh that this is the dilemma that i think the biden administration was wrestling with right you, you don't want to do 1980 you don't want to uh, have a policy that's unpopular and seen as 
uh, penalizing uh, athletes, but you do want to make a statement. Uh, so it has chosen this kind of middle path uh, where it's, you know, it said we're not going to send the usual diplomatic presence, you know, for Tokyo, for example, uh, Jill Biden was the representative um, that, that took the U.S. delegation uh, um, to the Tokyo Games. Uh, and dug him off to you know to the Paralympic Games, so that you know that that sort of presence is not going to happen this time. That's that's really what we're talking about, um, as opposed to you know the full on uh, boycott. But before we thank you for your time, uh, Doctor, I wanted to ask you about it. You wrote a piece recently in the uh, Journal of Contemporary China that takes a look at the effects of of uh, Xi Jinping's leadership on Chinese politics, foreign relations. Um, yeah. there, there's been some talk, I would say, in the so-called Western world recently about, you know, changes where people will say well, he's he's right up there with Mao now. And it's, it's like, you know, people draw a straight line across and talking about power and legacy. And I'm among those that would have no idea if somebody asked me one follow up question, I'd be screwed. I would have no idea what we're talking about. So can you give us one of the goals of this show is that, that average people, we can all sound smart talking about issues that are making news around the world. Can you bring us up to speed on, on leadership and its implications in China right now? Yeah, you've really done your homework, Brian. You're one of three people who's read that article. I'm so impressed. Um, <laughs> well, now I, it'll actually, be 300, we hope. <laughs> I just finished uh, I just finished a, a book manuscript. I just sent it to the publisher. Uh, it's about Xi Jinping. It's called The Xi Jinping Effect. Um, and it's about you know Chinese leadership politics uh, during the time that he's had power. He's had power since 2012. And he's really steered the country in a, in a much more totalitarian direction as far as, you know, um, foreign affairs. He's been uh, much more assertive, uh, uh, you know, militarizing places that Chinese foreign policy uh, had not been doing um, prior to his rise to power. He's been much less reluctant to allow anybody read Peng Shui, uh, challenge, um, you know, top leaders or certainly challenge his person. Uh, and he's been associated with lots more information control uh, and a heavy handed, you know, use of propaganda uh, in, in China. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're talking about Chinese politics and sport in a time when there's a powerful leader um, who is kind of micromanaging politics in ways that, that haven't been done. And he's doing it from the very top. Uh, so it's a it's a an interesting, dangerous time. In Chinese politics, and I think a lot of people are worried about the direction that China's going to go. Uh, there's more concern about a, a war between the U.S. and China now than has been the case in, in a very long time. Do you think it's? I mean, is that? Can you see that happening in the next ten years? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the Taiwanese foreign minister, yeah, yesterday uh, giving an interview to Australian media, said that he was worried about uh, you know, Chinese provocations starting World War Three. What what um, would what would be the tipping point to steal from Malcolm Gladwell? What would be the tipping point that you can see would lead to an actual conflict between, uh, you know, with apologies to Russia? Is it fair to call China and the U.S. the world's two superpowers? Yes, it is, uh, in part because Russia's economy is not not very large. You know, it's sort of Italian sized, whereas you know, the Chinese economy and the U.S. economy are are supersized uh, economies, um, the, the world's two largest Uh so uh, a clash between the two largest economies in the world would be catastrophic for their business and for you know, all the other countries that do business um, with China and the U.S. Uh, no, one, uh, no one brings that into question. But what would be the tipping point? I, mean, I think it's, it's really uh, Taiwan. Uh, you know, would, uh, you know, is, is China likely to you know, carry out uh, some of the invasion plans it's been working on uh, now for, for a long time? And use the resources that it's been you know, spending a lot of the funds from its economic boom on uh, to invade Taiwan, this you know, free democratic society. I, I think that might be the tipping point for the United States. And the U.S. under the Biden administration has been very clear uh, that it strongly supports Taiwan, uh, supports the status quo. The European Union is making some strong statements about that, too. I lied to you. I'm going to be honest. Oh, no. I, I lied to you because I, I implied oh, I implied that was going to be my last question. And then Eddie swoops in on our live chat with a question that maybe should have been my first question. So I'll wrestle with this. I'll be hard on myself for the rest of the day. Uh, but Eddie wonders, in, in what way are these games different than 2008 when China last hosted? He says they, they were communist in 2008 as well. What's the difference? Oh, it's absolutely. a great question. Yeah, oh, it's a great question, Eddie. Yeah, the Chinese, you know, China's been communist since the founding of this, you know, new country in 1949. 
Uh, she is more communist than his predecessor, who was in charge at the time of the 2008 Olympics, Hu Jintao. Uh, he also is is less concerned with international public opinion, uh, and he's and he's more concerned with rallying nationalism uh, to support um, his his objectives. Um, he's he's the son of a you know a top uh, party leader who you know was active in Mao's time. Uh, he he just uses his power very differently. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, you know, China's foreign policy, um, has, has brought the country into a number of conflicts like the two Michaels, uh, the Meng Wanzhou conflict, um, uh, with, with Canada. Uh, and, and that's something that we really didn't see in the run up to 2008. I was, I was in Beijing in 2008. It was a happy time. People were concerned about freedom of speech. Uh, people were, you know, uh, worrying about human rights, but it, it, it wasn't as important in the eyes of many as, you know, good business ties, um, you know, uh, developing economic connections, other connections with China. China was still seen as a place where, um, you know, you could do business, you could feel free, you could feel safe. Uh, and the Olympics was seen as this sort of superpower coming out party uh, uh, for China in, in 2008. And now, you know, in the, in the period of COVID, when we still don't really know, uh, you know, wh where COVID came from, from within China, you know, what did it come from a lab, you know, did it come from a web market? There's all this uncertainty about you know, the origins of COVID uh, and, and, and a lot of, um, you know, anti-Chinese sentiment that, that right or wrong is related um, to China's handling of the pandemic. This is all preceding these games. Uh, not to mention um, global perceptions of China uh, are, are, are vastly uh, diminished in terms of the number of people who like China, admire China, and want to want to work with China. That that was that was more of the 2008 era. You know, it's it feels like a bygone era now. Yeah, not uh, that long ago, but still a long time ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really does. It really does. Political scientist Dr. Ashley Asari, our guest, uh, a specialist in, in media and politics in China and Taiwan, uh, peace and security in East Asia and leadership politics. Thanks for your expertise. We really appreciate it. Oh, it was great, Ryan. Good to talk to you. Yeah, we'll talk to you again. If you okay. know somebody that you think would enjoy this interview, you know, maybe this would shine some light on their understanding of what a boycott could imply, what it might look like, what should Canada do if the Americans act, etc. We appreciate everybody that shares our content. Smash the like button if you liked what you just heard or if you appreciate the interview. You don't have to like what you hear to smash the like button on the interview, right? I love this from Jillian. Have we ever boycotted the U.S. with all the shit they've pulled? Can you imagine? Imagine the Canadians boycotting American games. We wouldn't have won that first gold in men's hockey in 50 years if we would have boycotted Salt Lake. The, the boycott in 84 in L.A. was interesting. Moscow in 80, interesting. I mean, the list of nations that boycotted, literally dozens of them, um, which is pretty remarkable. And, and, and different reasons there, the Soviet invasion of Russia in 1980, Jimmy Carter, the whole thing. And, um, you know, and then obviously sort of the reciprocal boycott when when uh, the Olympic Games touched down in, in the U.S. in 84 in Los Angeles. Interesting stuff. You can always send us your thoughts to talk at RyanJesperson.com. Our friends at McBain Camera want us to remind you today that the Fujifilm holiday sales are now on at McBain. You can save $500 on the Fujifilm X-T3 camera body. This is that high-performance premium camera. We guarantee it'll become an inseparable partner in your artistic journey. I love the look of it. It features an evolved processing engine. It improves the camera's ability to track moving subjects, which is great. You're shooting the kids, maybe tobogganing or something like that, maybe wildlife. It boosts your autofocus speed and your accuracy. Makes you look good is what we're getting at. For $13.99.99, you can get your hands on the Fujifilm X-T3 camera body right now at mcbainecamera.com and shop with confidence. That 30-day price protection guarantee. McBain, create to inspire. If you're looking for something creative and, and quite frankly, magical to do over the next few weeks, I encourage you to check out what the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra is up to via its website at windspearcenter.com. Get this, all of their December concerts, youth tickets are just $15. Adult tickets start at $25. There's high demand for these concerts, but they do have some seats still available. 
From December 17th through the 23rd, a traditional Christmas. You know, the selections from the Nutcracker Suite. I mean, I'm getting chills even thinking about it. December 18th through the 22nd, a holiday magic with a mix of, of carols, including like the Hollywood films, Home Alone, Grinch Stole Christmas, etc. And then Hollywood for the holidays from December 28th through 30. It is exactly what it sounds like. You can find out more details at windspearcenter.com. Our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park know that you want to have your freezer full of all the treats people are looking for through the month of December. It's why they've got their holiday log cakes on for half price, a fan favorite at Dairy Queen. Of course, you know what I'm talking about, the irresistible fudge and that crunchy center. I go straight for that. I'm the guy that goes straight through the ice cream, goes straight for the center. Surrounded by vanilla and chocolate soft serve, decorated with your favorite holiday design, perfect for potlucks. A perfect ending to a busy winter day. They're also selling their DQ bucks in support of the Stollery Children's Hospital. You donate five bucks, you get five bucks back in DQ bucks at the Dairy Queens of Palisades, Numeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. We saw this tweet. Uh, I mean, this is the a type of nightmare scenario for any family. An elderly and beloved matriarch falls. 95 years of age. She's left on the floor for an hour before an ambulance is able to arrive. Uh, Marcello DiCentio uh, tweeted about it. It was his grandma that was on the floor, and it prompted a response from Calgary's now former mayor, Nehead Nenshi, who would obviously know what he's talking about here. Uh, former Mayor Nenshi tweeting, it's time to admit that EMS in Alberta is terribly broken. And that the decision to remove local dispatch must be reversed. In other words, time to decentralize EMS as firefighters could have been there in minutes and may have been able to help. Uh, Marcello DiCentio, kind enough to join us now live on the show. Thanks for making time for us. I'm sorry to hear about your. Do you say Nona? Is that what you call her? Nona. Yes, my Nona. Nona. She's 95. Now, people will be relieved to hear you tweeted a follow up. You said, don't worry, everybody. She's going to be all right. You said she's she's bruised, but otherwise all right. The woman is Italian Wolverine. And everybody <laughs> breathed a sigh of relief. How's she doing today? She's, she's, she's doing all right. Yeah, she is. She really is an unbreakable woman. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Hopefully I share some of those genetics. Yeah, no kidding. 95 years of age, though, she falls. She's on the floor for an hour. Were you there with her? Was somebody there with her? Yeah, I, not it was I wasn't there. It was she was staying at my aunt at my aunt and uncle's place, and and so she 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 took a tumble in in the kitchen. And um, it's not the first time it's happened. Like I said, she's you know she's she, she's an older lady, and the last time, uh, uh, my aunt and uncle tried you know tried to pick her up, and and AHS home care told them like, listen, you shouldn't do that. You should know ne- next time this happens, you call you call nine one one. You know that's a, that's our job to do that. So when she took a tumble on Saturday. Uh, that's what that's what uh, my, my aunt did. It ca- called uh, called nine one one, and, and um, the first thing that the the dispatch asked her was what city you're in, and she, she thought that was a she thought that was an odd uh, uh, an odd question. And uh, it was an hour before uh, before the EMS showed up to, to, to the to the house. To be clear, they're in Calgary. Yes. So yes. Pe- so people listening to this uh, across the country won't need to be reminded that this is a city of a million people. Uh, yeah. It takes an hour to get an ambulance in a city of a million people. It, has this been a story that, I mean, we've been hearing some people, politicians, paramedics, advocates, union mm-hmm. representatives crying foul here, people involved in the healthcare system, uh, shining a light on these so-called red alerts, which are these sustained yeah. periods of time where no ambulances are available. Uh, Marcello, before this happened to your Nona, was, th- was this a story that had been on your radar? Oh, well, certainly. I mean, I mean, uh, it- when those, when those stories appear, when you you know when you, when you when you see the tweets about these kind of red alerts that are happening in Alberta, where where certain parts of, of the province have no ambulance service for 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 a period of time, it's it's pretty shocking. Um, never shocking though when it's when it's when it, of course when it's when it's when it's a member of your family waiting waiting for an ambulance. And that that Saturday they reported four times. <clears throat> pardon me, four times during that day there was no ambulance available for Calgary, and. and I can't even wrap my head around that being a possibility. Like, how, how could this be? Um, it's it's a it's a, it's a terrible situation. And I mean, I'm not. Uh, I mean, it's sort of maybe a fool's errand to start comparing scenarios because when you're known as they're bruised on the floor, 95 years of age, that's sure. obviously a top priority. 
but if there's a, if there's a, somebody about to give birth on the side of the Deerfoot yeah. Trail that needs an ambulance, they're going into labor on the side of the road. Or if there's been a mass casualty event, or if somebody's hit with gunfire, or if there's a fire, I mean, what have you? Uh, yeah. An hour is completely. I mean, ten minutes is an absolute eternity. Why did you go to Twitter? What were you? I mean, I noticed you tagged the premier, you tagged Minister Copping, you've you've, you've tagged Alberta Health Services. Um, I mean, do you find yourself? Are you pushed into a role now where you're saying that this is something I'm going to advocate on? Oh, of course. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I'm I'm sure like like many like many of your listeners and viewers, Ryan. I'm. I, I, I'm tired of being furious at, at, at what's what's going on in, in, in this province. I'm, t- I'm 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 exhausted by the kind of the cruel incompetence of, of what's of what's going on here on, on this file and, and so many others. And um, and yes, I did I, I did I did all the things that you're all the traditional things you're supposed to do. I wrote a letter. Uh, I wrote a, I wrote a note to, to my MLA. I, I sent a note to AHS, and everyone 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 responded. Um, uh, not 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 Premier Kenny, uh, but but. I got I got I got notes from my MLA from AHS who are going to look into the matter, um, but I think that Albertans and I don't have a huge Twitter following, but I think that Albertans need to understand what's going on here, or or, or not, or at least know what's going on. I don't, I don't think it's I don't think he needs to understand what's going on here. I mean, how how do you understand this? Um, but yeah, I, I think I think people should know. People should know the the the, the situation that that we're dealing with in. Um, in Alberta these days, with 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 EMS. What what were and, you and, uh, and Warren too? Like like, pardon me, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's fine. But, but like 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 uh uh, uh and then she said, you know, this, when when the province decided to to, to centralize the, the kind of the EMS uh, dispatch service, they were warned, right? I, mm-hmm. I think I think that, you know we were warned that this is there will be problems, and here we are with with problems. I mean, I mean, I'm, and, I'm and, just and gonna say like just, it, it was on this show. I mean, we had we had fire chiefs and mayors. On the record, people can go back and check the tape from yeah. uh, from Lethbridge and from Wood Buffalo, Fort McMurray and from all these communities from Red Deer saying like, like I remember one morning we had the mayors of, of Fort McMurray, Red Deer and Lethbridge on the same show going. This is a disaster yeah. in waiting. And now look yeah. what's happening. I mean, that's yeah. you, you call it when you don't want to be right. They called it nonetheless. Yeah. And let, let, let's be clear. You know, my my my, my grandmother fell. And, uh, and, she, and, and when my aunt called the, the, the 911, she said, no, that she, she was, she was not obviously injured. She was not bleeding. She was not unconscious. She hadn't had a heart attack or something like this. So, you know, I, I doubt that she was on the top of the priority list for EMS response. And I totally understand that. Of course not. Um, but it's still an emergency. You know, AHS told us that this is an emergency situation. And even if it's not the, you know, the top priority, it should not take an hour and an hour is not an emergency response. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, God forbid it was, it was, it was someone else who, who, knew, who needed, uh, uh, who needed urgent care, who needed life-saving uh, care. Uh, uh, what would have happened then? What, what if there was a mass casualty event, uh, car accidents, anything, anything like, anything like this when, during a red alert when there was literally no ambulances available? I just again, I have a hard time. I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. Uh, I, I like check these out. So these are just some other quick grabs. I mean, your your non story is one um, that's obviously extremely important, especially to your family. But if people check out the Twitter account HSA Alberta EMS, they can see these reports. I mean, you know, this is just from what was this Sarah yesterday? A Red Deer ambulance was responding to an emergency event in Calgary. I don't care how fast you're going on the QE2. It's uh, I happen to know from, you know, people have told me about the quickest you can get from Red Deer to Calgary is an hour. How about this? A Pritis ambulance, that's for people's reference, southwest of Calgary, responding from Okotoks to an emergency in Calgary. That's at least 20 minutes to a half an hour. What about this next one? This is this one was shocking to me. A car stairs ambulance was absent from car stairs for nine consecutive hours during a day shift on December 6th, that's yesterday, responding to events in other jurisdictions. Carstairs didn't have its ambulance for nine hours because it was out of district. These are ones we just pulled from yesterday. That's just yesterday. We deserve better than this, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, yes, it was my Nona on the floor. Absolutely deserved better than this. But so do we all, Ryan. You know, this, this, is, this is not, this is not, we deserve, we're, as citizens of, the, of this province, we, we deserve... Uh, uh, much better than they were getting uh, yeah. uh, from from this service. So and it's you, not it, listen. It's not the when, when the EMS show, when the EMS arrived 
you know, at my aunt's house, they were, they were amazing, right? They were amazing and, 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 and cared for, for my grandma, did everything that she, everything that she needed to be done. Um, so I'm not, it's, it's not, that's not where the, obviously that's not where the problem is. Right. I mean, let's be let's be clear. The, the, the problem is 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 is, is, ditch, is is somewhere else. It's it's not it's not the, these 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 men and women who are who are doing the work. I, I think you're advocating for those paramedics right now. I mean, as a matter of fact, this is a slight. It's the yeah. opposite of a slight. It's it's to Absolutely. ensure that they're well supported. I mean, these are people that have yeah. been. Have you ever see like a paramedic or a firefighter in some circumstances, police officers, but most especially the first two I mentioned, gear up in PPE, responding to a call. If you consider just that, just that extra yeah. little bit that's been added and then the stress and then going home to their families and then not sure if they're care. You know, I mean, just all of the things, uh, the lack yeah. of support is really remarkable. And, and I mean, I think that the, the government owes people an explanation here. I can't help it. I mean, I want to mention, you know, people can check out your, your website, Marcello Decentio. I didn't introduce you as an author, but you are, uh, and, and certainly your book here. Let me give you a shout out to your book because there sure. almost seems sure. to be like a, a theme here driven the secret lives of drivers, uh, your next one you never know maybe it's from you know the perspective behind the wheel of an ambulance who knows hey marcello yeah, maybe yeah maybe hey, well we wish you're not a quick healing thanks for doing this interview thanks for the advocacy uh, maybe to a certain degree you're surprised at, at how it caught on that's what happens when a former mayor retweets you right yeah and i and i think too and if, if you if you allow me like i, I don't want to be i don't want to be uh, uh morbid or melodramatic right you're not but being I think, I think there's i think there's a i think there's a personal thing here that I, I, I kind of want to express. Okay. So I have, I have a grandmother who, who's, who's almost 95 years old. She's in good shape. Like I said, she's unbreakable. She, uh, um, but there's, we don't have a lot of time left with her. And the thought that the, the, her last hour could have been waiting for an EMS on, on, on the, on the tile kitchen floor, that, that breaks my heart. You know, and, and again, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to, to, to put to put to center my experience and our my family's experience in the middle of all this. Every you know, this is a, this is a problem for everybody. But my God, Ryan, to imagine that that to imagine that is is a uh, is is heartbreaking, and it, and it, and it and it 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 causes such sadness, and then it causes such absolute fury. And um, like I said, uh, we all deserve better. My grandma deserves better. You deserve better. Albertans deserve better than this. Craig's watching right now. He says, I'm thinking about my late grandmothers and I'm getting really sad uh, thinking how I'd feel if something like this happened to them. He said, I'd be experiencing rage. It would be a heartbroken rage. And I'm glad that Marcello's non is OK. But wow, I'm just hot right now, says Craig. Thanks for talking to us. You're impacting change. We appreciate. Oh, and a shout out, by the way, from Fatima. I just noticed this as I'm thanking you for your time. Uh, she wanted to uh, recognize an incredible book you wrote. She says called Pay No Heed to the Rockets, Life in Contemporary Palestine. She says that was a phenomenal work. That's very kind. Thank you. You can uh, read more about what Marcello writes at Marcello com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Dissentio. Uh, of course, we link to Sarah does by we, the royal we. I don't do any of that work. Sarah does all that work. Linking to our other guests that are coming up here on the show every morning from our Twitter account at Real Talk RJ. That includes uh, Ray Cash Walters, Joshua Seeley Harrington, and Sharif Haji coming up in just a second. We're going to get into the, the verdict uh, delivered in the U.S. Three men found guilty of uh, murder charges in the uh, senseless killing of Ahmad Arbery, an innocent man, an innocent black man out for a run. We're going to take a look at the Kyle Rittenhouse verdict, acquitted of all charges in that deadly Kenosha, Wisconsin shooting. Uh, two men killed, a third person wounded. And then the Charlottesville. Uh, you saw this probably uh, following that 2017 Unite the Right rally in downtown Charlottesville. More than $25 million awarded in financial compensation. We're going to get into this. Was justice served in the Ahmad Arbery case? Uh, argue two of our guests coming up in just a moment not even close that piece in the globe and mail will find out why first i want to remind you that we through the show and then through the day are keeping an eye on our hashtag real talk rj it's powered by our friends at park power your friendly local utilities provider you can check out and compare rates on their website from the convenience of your own home right now at parkpower.ca and when you take your business over to them it's never been easier because their team will handle all the dirty work you don't have to sit on hold with your former company and then answer questions like well why are you leaving what if we gave you this and you're like listen i just want to quit i just want to quit you i don't want you to text me i don't want you to call me we're not going to the christmas party together anymore because i'm going with park power the promo code 2021 dash real talk will get you 70 dollars off your first bill no strings attached at parkpower.ca our friends at eden landscaping well they know what it's like you know maybe you missed out on getting your deck or your gazebo built this year it happens 
Maybe it was lumber prices. Maybe it was something else. Maybe you need a roof on your deck. You want to be barbecuing in January. Or maybe a three-season room, a perfect addition. Maybe you know somebody that would love something like that. And the gift of landscape design might fit them perfectly. Why not help them see a picture of what their outdoor space brought to life might look like? You can find out more details by getting in touch with Mike and his team at Eden Landscaping via their website, landscapeedmonton.ca. And, of course, we want you to know about this coming up this weekend. Our friends at Breathe Outdoors, a beautiful rebrand. Uh, you knew them formerly as Campers Village. At breatheoutdoors.ca, you can check out how they've completely reinvented what they're doing while sticking to the tradition of making sure you are properly outfitted to hit the great outdoors. Coming up this weekend, uh, they want to let you know, I mean, the Winter Adventure Sale starts up on December 10th. Want to have this on your radar up to 40% off selected gear. Very cool. The best way to find out what's on sale is to sign up for their Campers Club. That's their newsletter list that's got some really great perks. Uh, You can learn more at breatheoutdoors.ca slash campers dash club. You can find them online also under the sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Well, as mentioned, several verdicts, several high-profile trials on the heels of horrific acts of racially motivated violence have got us talking about racism, systemic racism, not just in the United States, but in Canada as well. Was justice served, for example, in the Ahmad Arbery case? Not even close, argued two of our guests, contributors to a recent piece published November 30th in the Globe and Mail. That's criminal defense lawyer Ray Cash Walters and lawyer law professor Joshua Seeley Harrington. We're also joined uh, today by Sharif Haji, executive director of the Africa Center. I'm grateful that the three of you have made time for us this morning. I want to encourage you to please build on what each other says. Let's treat it like we're out for coffee. Don't worry about interrupting me. Let's get into this. Ray Cash, it's great to see you again, my friend. Our paths haven't crossed in several years. You're now in the big smoke practicing law like you always knew you were going to do and making a huge impact. What prompted you to co-author this piece for the Globe and Mail, what was it that that prompted you to say, reach out and say, hey, hang on a second, this is not justice, regardless of the fact that these three men were convicted? Yeah, I think uh, I'm really lucky to have friends like Josh who include me in all of the brilliant thinking and writing uh, that they do. And I think as, as someone who sees again and again in an intimate way, right, as a community member, but also uh, as a criminal defense lawyer, the ways in which uh, the criminal justice system, the criminal legal system, and some people say the criminal punishment system um, fails to actually bring justice. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we decided to write this piece. I think as much as folks, and we said this in the piece, as much as folks were uh, happy to see that the killers of Ahmad Aubrey were held to account, um, a lot of folks were a bit surprised. I think that really actually points to the fact that it's rare that Black pain, Black suffering, Black death is actually acknowledged um, uh, by the criminal justice system. Hmm. Uh, Josh, I want to establish for our audience here that uh, not, not only are you obviously a lawyer at Power Law, but you're also an assistant professor at the Lincoln Alexander School of Law and a doctoral candidate at Columbia Law School, one of the more celebrated law schools in the United States. Uh, interesting and informed perspective you bring to the table. You, you take a look at this verdict. Uh, Ahmad Arbery killed senselessly, uh, I mean, essentially lynched in the street. Uh, the initial response by police completely insufficient they find him alive still alive they don't tend to him immediately charges aren't laid for a series of weeks uh i mean this thing really was not taken seriously until it was and last week we heard from the reverend al sharpton who said hey today here black lives do matter do you disagree with the reverend on that uh i i don't disagree with black lives mattering uh but but i think that uh the idea that how we recognize the value of black life is through the operation of the criminal punishment system is one of the animating principles uh, for me and Ray Cash in terms of writing this piece. I think that, you know, as we explained, these types of events can provide catharsis or an outlet for grief uh, or emotional processing. Uh, But when we're thinking about racial justice, And when we're thinking about justice, which, you know, in my perspective speaks to the structural conditions of black people and black communities more broadly, 
we have to not only think about catharsis uh, and the emotional consequences of verdicts like this. We have to think about how systems operate with respect to certain communities. And criminal punishment, by and large, is not a system that provides for Black liberation or Black flourishing. In fact, it's one of the main state institutions that is uh, provides for a lot of oppression, subordination, and social control of Black people. And so while there may be a certain emotional outlet that's provided by these types of verdicts, we have to be really careful uh, to not allow this to permit the ongoing, not only use, but expansion of systems that are fundamentally anti-Black. Sharif Haji, your executive director of the Africa Center, sort of two things jumped out at me as these verdicts are, are delivered over the past couple of weeks. Uh, you know, Greg and Travis McMichael, William Bryan, their neighbor, found guilty here of murder, and they'll face federal hate crime charges coming up at a trial in, in February. And, and a lot of people seemed surprised, uh, as gut-wrenching and brutal as that is, a lot of people seemed surprised that they were convicted on, on virtually all charges laid. Meantime, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse acquitted of all charges uh, in a deadly shooting after pleading self-defense in that incident in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where he showed up ostensibly armed to protect properties that didn't belong to him across state lines. I think most people understand some of the basic details of that story. And, and what was the public narrative? People said, not surprised, not surprised at all. Kyle Rittenhouse got off, was acquitted on all charges. How did you wrap your mind around those two verdicts and, and the bigger picture, Sharif? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, the, the issue is that uh, the system was built, um, in my view, the system produces what it was built to produce. Um, and, and, and it takes ages to assist the system to, uh, to change. And people are surprised if they see something that the system used to not produce. Um, so, uh, for example, this case, after Jacob Blake, the 29, 29 years old black man was shot, Rhinos traveled from his, small, his uh, 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 home in Illinois to Kenosha. It's 20 miles away. Using an uh, uh, um, assault rival, and he shot three black innocent men. So if you go back and check those people who are killed, there were people who are suffering with so many factors that doesn't even come into surface of conversation. It indicates the disparity of treatment between white and black when it comes to law and justice. And I will leave that to the lawyers who are on the uh, on the panel with me today. Well, and, and I want to encourage all three. You know, I don't I mean to cut you off, Sharif. Please continue. Yeah. So so the issue is that that he made the long trouble. 20 miles away, goes to a different place to protect properties, quote unquote. Kills three black men. One of them, the day that person was killed, was discharged from the hospital. So when I'm uh, I'm, I'm right, the system is that that whether it is the media, whether it is the, the 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 governing system, whether it is every aspect of it is built around these injustices and disparities, and then if there is anything that is is ways away what the system used to produce, it becomes a newsworthy. And I'll, I'll and, and I'll use an example of what happened on this case. Just I think it was a week ago. Right at here is a broadcast, a conservative broadcast, interviewed after Kyle was, was acquitted, interviewed. And during the broadcast, the co-host Sidney Watson told writers and says, these are her words, it is kind of impressive that all the people that you shot at, you killed probably two of the worst on the planet, Ferring Harper and Rosenbaum, because she feels those had criminal records. And one of them, was released from the hospital on the same day that he was shot. I want to. I just. I just want to clarify uh, with, with regards to the, the the victims of Kyle Rittenhouse shooting, uh, not black men. Anthony Huber, Joseph Rosenbaum, and then Gage uh, Grosskreutz is, is the one that sustained the injury. I just want to just clarify that. But there certainly is relevance here with regards to the racial implications of this, whether it's the verdict 
or otherwise. Uh, Ray Cash, people, I mean, you're, you're obviously practicing law in Canada, uh, you know, in Canada's largest city, uh, and, and no Canadian city is immune from gun violence. We certainly see that. It's an issue across the country. We, we had an interesting conversation impromptu on the show yesterday around gun culture, so to speak, in the United States and whether Canada's that much different. And I think you can have a fulsome conversation about that. But when we take a look at this and some of the, the systemic uh, racism on display here in these verdicts and otherwise, and in the bigger pictures, we talk about the legal system. How do you compare or contrast the reality in Canada to that of our neighbors in the United States? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of things to contrast. I think obviously we don't have the same uh, sort of free reign to access guns in Canada um, as they do in the States, but we do have cases uh, like Colton Bushi being killed by Gerald Stanley and then Gerald Stanley being completely acquitted by his all-white jury. And so we we continue to, to see that white fear of black, black and indigenous people and otherwise racialized and marginalized people um, can can be sort of approved of by the public. And there's no real pushback when black and indigenous folks are experiencing pain and violence. Um, and I think that's an enduring kind of point of disappointment for folks in Canada. But in, in America, at least they're having these conversations about anti-black racism. They're having these conversations about um, uh, systemic violence against black and indigenous people. Uh, but in Canada, we, we have this sense of an exceptionalism and we believe that, well, you know, there's only that violence that happens in the States and in, in Canada, we're so much better. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it's challenging to continue to have the same sort of conversations over and over again, uh, about this Canadian exceptionalism. And I think it's time we really move into a space of what a lot of people call praxis, which is acknowledging now, okay, we've seen repeatedly, this is the information that we have about systemic uh, racism. And, and, and now we're going to take that into practice. We're going to take that into our everyday lives. We're going to Im impute that into policy. Um, and, you know, to be honest, Ryan, I think as, as someone who we've had conversations in the past on, on your other show about what it means for uh, folks in community to take up that mantle. And I'm really interested for you, how do you engage with you know, as a as a white man in Canada, how do you engage with these instances of racism, and and what do you feel like your responsibility is? I think we're all implicated mm -hmm. um, in these repeated instances of of violence, and so I'm and these systemic interest in instances of violence. So I'm wondering for you, like, w what are the stakes? Well, I think we're doing part of it right now. I think having these conversations is important, and and I think that not washing our hands. Of this, I mean, in other words, you know, having or soliciting a Canadian perspective on something that I think, I mean, I see it myself uh, in conversations that Canadians have, like you talk about, about this sort of exceptionalism, right? And I think it's time we, you know, we promise people uncomfortable conversations every single day uh, in an effort to challenge ourselves and better understand, I think, some of the stories that don't typically have the amplification that they deserve. Um, you know, Josh, I wanted to ask you, you know, one of the additional. I mean, you know, we're putting this together and, and as a team, we're sort of, you know, workshopping some of the different verdicts and trials and, and court cases that, that I think contribute to this bigger conversation. And we see that, you know, after this Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, just absolutely uh, tragic and a total disaster back in 2017, uh, nine people injured during that rally entitled to more than twenty five million dollars in financial compensation. So declares a jury back in November, reaching a partial verdict, but the jury could not agree on the most serious claims that the defendants, uh, white supremacists, neo-Nazis among them, engaged in a conspiracy to commit violence under federal law. So I don't know if you want to describe it as a win and a loss or a partial win, but what's the significance of, of that $25 million awarded in compensation, do you think? Um, I mean, I think that uh, I think that this idea of winning and losing is baked into how we conceptualize courtrooms and the justice system as, or courtrooms, I should say, as a place where we achieve justice. Um, when a, a lot of the things that, uh, you know, Ray Cash and myself think we need to be emphasizing is our broader social and economic order that gives rise to the structural injustice that black and indigenous people experience. So, you know, in the context of any individual verdict, 
Um, I don't think that you can ever find justice for you know dispossessed and disenfranchised communities. Um, I think that the questions that we need to be talking about um, need to be ones that center in on how public policy creates conditions that results in vulnerability for specific groups within society. Um, and so, you know, it, it, you know, what what does this individual verdict do for broader systemic justice against white nationalism? Um, I don't know. Where's that money going? Right. <laughs> you know, it's not. I, I don't think of uh, a win or a loss in any one courtroom mm. as something that really guarantees any measure of justice more broadly. Um, and, and this is the point I was trying to raise earlier in terms of, um, you know, there can be an emotional consequence. There can be catharsis. There can be an outlet. Um, but if we're going to talk about racial justice in the United States or America, um, we need to talk about the patterns of vulnerability that we create for people. Um, we need to talk about like healthcare in the United States. We need to talk about drinking water on reserves. Um, you know, these things aren't solved by a guilty verdict in a courtroom for one individual. And the extent to which we frame the discussion as whether or not those verdicts get us there obscures the fact that they will never get us there that they actually are structurally incapable of bringing about the kind of justice that we're talking about. I, I appreciate that point. I think it's such an important point that when you talk about equity, or when you talk about, a, a, you know, sort of addressing and impacting these systemic issues that it extends far beyond the courtroom and it, it extends outside the halls of power. And like you talked about healthcare, et cetera. I mean, Sharif, I think that this is, I mean, we, we invited here, we want you to help us understand the Canadian experience in the sense, I mean, your advocacy, right? You've worked with government ministries, seniors, housing, health, right? You've overseen all of these provincial files, including affordable housing, primary health care strategy. Can you give us a sense of, of some of these barriers that exist and what you see on an almost daily basis and maybe steps that are being taken to address that? Well, thanks, Ryan. The What's newsworthy um, in our societies today is uh, the only systemic racism outcomes that we see on the video footages, whether it is Arbery or whether it is um, uh, other uh, Black Canadians or, or Black Americans who uh, kind of see the consequences of injustices of that are captured on a footage, right? But the thing is that the Canadian system or the systemic racism, racism the outcomes, whether it is health outcome, whether it is social outcomes, are not something that the media captures quite a lot. And interestingly, the good thing with the United States, if there is something good, is that they capture some of the information, they have the data to show. In the Canadian context, we don't. I'll give you some examples of what we see. The, in 2016 data of Statistics Canada, there was a sample of that data that was anal analyzed to look into, and I'll bring that home, not even Canada, but I'll bring that to, 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 to Edmonton. 30% of black children live in low income situations. It's only 10% for the rest of the population. So you can see in terms of where it starts from early in the years in terms of disparity of how children are raised up. That's one example. And if you took, take that education-wise, black and white have equally in terms of, 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 of the level of education. This is the Edmonton data. If you look at in terms of the labor participation, it's the same, but unemployment, it's twice higher among the black population than the rest. When it comes to income gap, it is, 20,000 difference in terms of income gap and uh, uh, medium incomes that they make between uh, uh, the rest of the population and the black in Edmonton, for example. So those are some of the social outcomes that we see from the system. However, there's no intentionality in terms of collecting information to look into the issues of inequity and address that. I give you another example. I've been writing among other social services organizations to the Ministry of Health, former Minister Chandra, over a year ago, and asking we wanna see the implications of COVID-19 
among racialized populations to see how race plays a factor, not because of the biological changes, but your exposures, your susceptibility, your living conditions, and how these things impact on our lives. And then in the long term, what are the implications from an equity perspective that, it's, that springs up? So such information is not collected. Lack of collection of information, not having such a data will kind of leave you not to make the policies that will uh, address some of the, the, the inequities that exist in our society. And Ryan, if you look at, for example, in Edmonton, our city council spent more hours last year than they spent on the core services on the issue of racism and race relations. So, but it is an important, it's like some things that we are spending a lot of time, our elected officials, but in terms of allocation of resources, in terms of putting the right infrastructures that are supposed to address this, will it, uh, completely are not even talked about. So these are some of the systemic racisms that we see. The only things that people get attention and we respond to are things that are on a video footage because of it's captured, because of it is uh, uh, widely shared through social media. So we have to do something. But the underlying factors that impact our societies from an equity perspective, not only impacting on racialized populations, but our systems as Canadians that actually shatter our core values, which is based on equity as a building society, is a problem. Yeah, I mean, you you've just if brought. I could. Yeah, please do, Ray Cash. I was just going to make the quick point that I, I mean, you're 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 you know, you you reiterate and you bring this full circle, Sharif, in the sense that if that if Ahmad Arbery's murder. Uh, had not been caught on video, I think it's safe to assume that there would have been zero justice. Now, I know that Ray Cashin will hand it over to you. You, you know, you, you you argue in your piece in the Globe that justice was not served, but there would, I think, fair to say, not have even been arrests. It did not appear as though this was being taken seriously to any degree until that video became unignorable. Agreed. And I, I think I just want to, though, uh, pick up on a point, a really important point that I think Sharif made, which is that so often our exposure to our public exposure in the media to blackness and being is in instances of black folks being killed hmm. right and so we are disproportionately so at the same time right it's just catch 22 at the same time that we acknowledge that the only way to get some semblance of justice in instances of violence against black folk is if something goes viral at the same time, we're, we're the only time we're exposed to blackness in the public is when there's violence against black bodies, right? So mm. what that does is the representation of, of black folks in, in our imagination and our collective imagination is not that of folks who are engaging in educational reform, po uh, helpful policy, uh, entrepreneurship, politics. That's not the that's not the ways in which we conceptualize a black person in public life. The way we conceptualize a black person in public life is someone with their head under a police officer's knee. Mm. And so how does that have long lasting impacts on the ways in which black people navigate the world? And I think one you know, really upsetting example of this for me personally is to see how Anime Paul was treated as the leader of the Green Party. So when black folk actually you know, 100% qualified for these positions and, and are potentially placed to have a, a, an impact on the material conditions of Black folk, right, in, in policy uh, decision-making at the highest level, those people are pushed out immediately before they can have any sort of impact. That's such a good and important point, Ray Cash. I appreciate it. Joshua, before we thank the three of you, uh, for your time, I want to give you last word on this. And we oftentimes ask our expert guests to give us something to walk with and think about and ponder. And I know that this is an audience that's engaged and that endeavors to impact its its community, wherever that may be. What's something you'd like us to to consider over the next number of days or weeks? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to jump off of Ray Cash's point. I, I think there's a, a complicity in media in terms of the shaping of narratives of racial injustice. Um, and so, like, you know, on on your show, like, I think you know, t when we ask questions like whether or not there is systemic racism in Canada or whether or not a verdict brings justice, I think that this is something that actively contributes to this infinite cycle of obscuring structural inequality. Uh, and, you know, Canada's always had systemic racism. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to have, I think we need to have conversations about how to change that as opposed to identifying it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think there's an exhaustion on the part of Black, Indigenous, and other marginalized folks in terms of this, uh, 
replication of discourse around the presence of inequality as opposed to how we actually engage with it. Um, and so, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you in terms of the types of um, conversations you platform and engage in um, to push towards, you know, active, uh, you know, policy and structural change. Yeah, and that's what I'm that, curious to hear that, about. Yeah, that's yeah. why I'm asking you about it. Mm -hmm. Well, no, and, and so that's what I mean. Like there's a, there's a, uh, the cycle of the identification of systemic racism, mm -hmm. I think is we like, I think we can take that as a starting point yeah. and say, what are we doing with education? What are we doing with health? What are we doing with drinking water? What are we doing with criminal punishment? Um, and this, and this is like, the, this is the really key point in what me and Ray Cash are saying. When we think of the verdict as something that brings justice, when we ask that question, it's a question that reinforces the functioning of a system that's fundamentally anti-Black. The more money that we put into criminal punish punishment, when we see it as a vehicle for positive change, that's money that takes away from resources that could otherwise contribute to Black flourishing. So it, it's, 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 I understand the motivation for the question, but it's one that ultimately reinforces structural inequity. Um, and so I, 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 I wanna caution uh, how we examine these types of issues because very subtly they can reinforce the very systems that subordinate us. I appreciate every single perspective brought to the table today. I appreciate your availability and uh, we'll commit to continuing these conversations on this platform. I'm grateful for the time and expertise this morning of criminal defense lawyer Ray Cash Walters, uh, law professor and lawyer Joshua Seeley Harrington and Sharif Haji, who joined us as executive director of the Africa Center. Thank you to the three of you for this. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. You can let us know what you think about this interview. Uh, we're always curious to know what's resonating with you, what you're taking away from it, what action it may prompt, what perspective you may have gleaned from it. You can be in touch with us anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We're so grateful for the thoughts that you share with us every day. It influences and impacts our editorial perspective. These conversations happen because we have sponsors that commit to making sure that we can come to you live and bring you this podcast every single day however you get access to the show st albert dodge has been there along with sherwood dodge ensuring that real talk happens they pride themselves on not just the sales experience but the service experience as well their customers return they bring their business back which is a big deal you have options they know it and they're proud of what their teams are doing right now ensuring that your family or you get into the ride that's a perfect fit you can shop their new and used selection right now, including those heavy-duty trucks at stalbertdodge.com, sherwooddodge.com as well. Our friends at Kubi Energy are bringing solar energy solutions to power your life. I love we're starting to see positive reflections submitted every single week on Twitter. It's a great place to hit us up. You can follow Kubi as well, uh, Kubi Energy on Instagram, and see some of the amazing work that they're doing. Installs, commercial, residential, industrial, agricultural, Super cool stuff on the innovative edge of what sustainable energy is going to look like moving forward. The same deal with local waste. As a family-owned business, they've been keeping it local in construction, commercial, and residential waste and recycling collection for more than a quarter century, and they continue to grow. If you're uh, talking to us, I mean, if you're tuning in from Western Canada, Saskatchewan, Alberta, it's not my announcement to make, but you're going to start seeing a few more local waste trucks in your neck of the woods. You'll go, well, how do you know where I am? Doesn't matter. They're growing big time. They're also, of course, bringing us Trash Talk every single week here on the show. You can get whatever you need off your chest. We got an amazing Trash Talk yesterday about my interview style. I can't wait to read it to you on Friday. It was written with a blowtorch and brought to you by Local Waste at localwaste.ca. Our friends at Friesen Brothers know that this is one of the most special times of year where family will gather. And, of course, they would love to put you in a position where you leave the work to them. So you can just be there with the people that you love. It's it's none of the work and all of the credit with Friesen Brothers Catering. All the praise will land in your lap if you hand things over to their team of Red Seal chefs. 16 locations where you can pick up across the province of Alberta. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. We wanted to let you know that our question of the week is back. Uh, the team at Y Station, our official research and strategy partners, took a few well-deserved weeks off. They did like 50 in a row for us. Just remarkable. And hundreds of you every week have chimed in to share your thoughts with us. This one, we're expecting to be no different. Uh, and I'm looking forward to what you have to say. If, if you go to RyanJesperson.com and you click at the top under Sponsors, you can find there the teams that make this happen, including Y Station. Right next to that is Question of the Week. We call it Get Real, our question of the week. We're talking about photo radar. 
cash cow or lifesaver or something in between. This week, Alberta's provincial government added new restrictions around the use of photo radar, including limiting it in residential areas, extending a freeze on the purchase of new equipment, and promising that drivers won't get multiple tickets within a five-minute stretch. We want to know your thoughts on photo radar and the new real rules. And, and of course, it's all confidential, so you can be as honest as you want. Um, I've, I've not polled the audience uh, here, the, the live studio audience, doubling as uh, colleagues and staff here. Um, I, 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 I want to say I suspect I know where you're going to land on photo radar, but that, that might be an assumption, which you know what they say about those. Uh, are you pro or against photo radar, or am I oversimplifying the question? I'm all for photo you're radar. You're all for photo radar, and how come? Because if you're speeding, uh, you should not be speeding, and <laughs> there should be a deterrent for speeding. And uh, that idea that you can't do it within the like a five minute radio, like five minute window, yeah, that's garbage. Why is that garbage? Because if you're speeding, you're still speeding. But you're you think it's fair if they had a van and then 100 meters later another van and then 100 meters later another van and you get triple banged? If you're still speeding, nah, yeah. Nah, because you don't even know you have the ticket in the first I place. Don't, I, well, they have a big... Uh, in Edmonton, there's like massive yellow trucks. Yeah. And so if you're not paying attention, if you're texting and you're yeah. not seeing those trucks, like, sorry to be you. you yeah. this, these are These are choices. You are choosing. You sound like a, these are choices. <laughs> and like, there are consequences okay. for choices. Like, wah, wah, this is life. You're an adult. You have a driver's license. You've got your vehicle. If you're choosing to speed, you're choosing to have a ticket. Love I it. have zero sympathy. Hot take, no wiggle room. Sam Brooks, pro or anti photo radar? I'm, I'm going to take the somewhere in between. I think that the uh, the changes got it backwards. The like, like, I would like to see photo radar only on residential streets. Uh. I think that it's it's an ineffective tool on freeways, on larger high speed zones. I think that the disconnect of, you know, you drove past a van and two weeks later you get a ticket and there's no demerits. Whereas if you're pulled over and you actually get demerits, you actually take it seriously. So I think it's a good tool for getting people to slow down around playground zones, getting people to slow down around school zones, getting people like in the places where safety is absolutely critical and there's pedestrians around it's a great tool for that. And that's why I'm a little bit baffled by that's one of the restrictions they put on it. I love your take. I love your take on yes in residential areas and no in more high speed freeways and, and more free flow areas. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of photo radar and not just because I have a heavy foot, uh, but also because I think that relatively speaking, it's ineffective. And I think that there are other ways to enforce speed. Um, you know, including more police officers making stops that can also intercept things like stolen cars, drunk driving uh, in worst case scenarios, uh, you know, crimes in progress, et cetera. I think that that more police on the streets is a good thing when it comes to law enforcement, including speeding enforcement. I don't think that getting a note in the mail, uh, you know, for 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 a lot of people, especially a sort of a largely affordable note, people always say that th things that are handled by fines are disproportionately punishing the lower income earners. Yes. And, right. I mean, I think there's also room for conversations around whether or not, you know, you do what you do in Finland, for example, where speeding tickets are tied to income. So if you're Timu Solani and you get a speeding ticket in Finland, I can't remember the story exactly. We cost him like 100 grand uh, for speeding in that. Finland. Yeah. So it's kind of an interesting one as well. Like what, I, what does a multimillionaire care about a $130 speeding ticket? They don't care at all. Whereas somebody, you know, a single parent scraping by 130 bucks is a huge deal. I mean that, you know, you don't have milk for a week or something like that. I just don't think you throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to uh, tickets and saying that it disproportionately affects people at lower income. Like I think that they are effective to a point. And I mean, talk about systemic issues it's about street um it's about size of vehicles that are like creating danger on the streets but more so more than anything it's street design mm. so people are going to drive what they feel is appropriate for the street design yeah and so if you've got big massive uh, roadways and people are speeding it's because and it's in residential areas it's because the street design is indicating how they should be driving. We got to get city planner Brent Totterin back on the show to talk about this. Vancouver's former chief planner has done some amazing work and some great points there. Um, that's a conversation we'll continue, of course, fueled by your feedback. So what we need you to do uh, and tell your friends too. go to RyanJesperson.com, click on question of the week and let us know what you think. We'll have the results for you early next week. And of course, our Patreon supporters will have the full top sheets, the top line report, we call it. Typically, it's 15, sometimes 20 pages. Amazing insight into where the audience is out on questions like this. This is everyday kind of stuff uh, coming up tomorrow on the show. How long should friendships last? 
I love this question. Dr. William Rollins from the University of Ohio will join us to talk about some of his recent research, plus logging in B.C. New analysis shows that, well, maybe we haven't had as much of a conversation on this as we should. We're going to bring you up to speed, plus other news as it develops right here on your home for real talk. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. The gun away.